the one thing that that brings up and that's interesting is certain individuals in the UFC, for example, namely the middleweight champion who's undefeated in his weight class did have a manifestation of pretty bad gynecomastia recently out of seemingly nowhere. And it led to a lot of. I drink very seldom. Um, and when I do drink, I, I don't drink very much and I've never really, um, liked cannabis or THC, but, but I had a couple of, um, roommates when I was in college who were really into training and, um, were very healthy. Didn't look like they had any kind of, uh, at least from the, from the look of them, didn't look like they had any kind of hypoconatal type symptoms and got pretty severe cases of, of gynecomastia from, uh, marijuana. Um, is that chronic and, use or like acute, like, cause the one thing that that brings up and that's interesting is certain individuals in the UFC, for example, namely the middleweight champion who's undefeated in his weight class did have a manifestation of pretty bad gynecomastia recently out of seemingly nowhere. And it led to a lot of, he's a guy, Israel Adesanya. Have you seen the, like, I don't know how I, much I know you follow him. I yeah. know of him, but I don't know. Well, I've been out to the UFC training center before because of the, we actually have a collaboration that's um, brewing there with the, uh, between uh, my lab and another lab at Stanford and, and uh, Duncan French out there. Uh, okay. It's early days. It's, it hasn't been stamped down yet, but it's... it's okay, um, feel, but, feel free to skim yeah. over this question if you think it's like too <laughs> problematic with your relationship. But this guy oh, no, said... No. He's uh, undefeated in his weight class, and he it's interesting because he calls out like juice heads all the time or guys that he thinks are on gear by the look of their physique. And he's a highly skilled fighter, and he still beats these guys who are like totally out muscling him from like a they look like, you know, just beasts. And then he still, you know, dismantles them. But his most not the most recent fight he had, but one of them, he was fighting a guy named Paulo Costa, which is like one of the most sauced up looking guys in the entire the entire UFC and he was, you know, constantly, you know, berating him about being on sauce. And, you know, he's, he takes a ton of steroids and blah, blah, blah. And then at the weigh-ins, Israel shows up with the manifestation of like one of the worst unilateral gynecomastia cases I've ever seen in the UFC and just doesn't talk about it. Doesn't touch on anything. People were asking about it in the post-fight conference. He says, why are you looking at my tits? Blah, blah, blah. He's not, he just doesn't want to talk about it. And eventually you know, a lot of people, there's a lot of specul speculation that if you see a random manifestation of gyno out of, out of nowhere, you think automatically this guy has significantly altered his hormone profile in some way that is causing an estrogen to androgen imbalance or progestogenic activity or IGF-1 or something that's causing an exacerbation of tissue development. And he's a well-known, like, you know, cannabis user. He's prevalently, you know, used it. He's very, very outspoken about his use of it, but it's not like he has only just started smoking recently. Like he's always been doing it for years and he's still a young, relatively young guy. I think he's like 31 or 30 or something like that. So for randomly him to get gyno out of nowhere, despite having used cannabis for years prior, you know, it really led to a lot of accusations about steroid use and he claims it was the cannabis use so i'm wondering first of all i don't know if you saw that guy or what do you think there would be any credibility to his statements and your friends was that acute exposure or chronic that led to that okay so i mean i obviously i don't know the situation with um yeah it would be kind of hard for me to just yeah I, 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 I couldn't i couldn't even speculate about him although i will say that the 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 testing in the ufc is extremely stringent um, I'm, I know, and I'm in touch with some of the folks out there. It, they take that very seriously because it's a sport where people are harming one another, not just playing a sport. Right. So, yeah. it, you know, uh, I do some work with athletes, uh, in other sports. I mean, there are professional sports leagues for which, um, hormone augmentation is actually allowed if people have been injured. Um, you know, I won't reveal what major organizations those are, but yeah, no um, that, but, but, you know, I think when people see it, um, and, uh, this is non UFC, I want to be very clear, non UFC. I can say that with certainty. Um, yeah. The UFC that, already like weeded out the TRT debacle, whereas other yeah. leagues in particular are not as stringent about even monitoring that. And that's significant, let alone like yeah. they're, they're on top of as much as they can physically be on top of with high level randomization and frequency, whereas other leagues not so much, but anyways. Yeah. Right. So the, the cases that I um, 
was witness to uh, that uh, in college were people who um, who ramped up their cannabis use and um, and experience it, at, you know, gyno. Now, the um, what's interesting is if you look at the scientific data, the peer reviewed data on cannabis and testosterone, it's all over the place. Some studies say it makes testosterone go up. Other studies say it makes testosterone go down. And when you dig into the method sections on these papers, which um, I've done, what you find is that the fact that it's all over the place makes total sense. Uh, Derek, you you would immediately know why this was the case because, and I'm sure you're familiar with this, but in some cases they're testing it like immediately after use. In other cases, uh, yeah. they're looking at it two days later. So you can imagine a situation where there's a big increase in testosterone, then an aromatization that's it, that's may or may not have anything to do with the cannabis. And I mean, the data are all over the place because the, the, te- the testing times relative to the cannabis use are all over the place. And so I think if I had to speculate on what is relevant for most people, I would say that everybody is going to react differently. I doubt it's completely random. We could say people are going to react differently without saying that everyone's going to have a vastly different um, response. You can imagine it's kind of a bimodal distribution where maybe 60 or 70% of people will not experience much much or a significant change in their endocrine profile or estrogen profile, but then they're going to be a subset of individuals, maybe 10 or 15 that are going to have huge increases in aromatization. And I think that's what you see. And that's why things get the reputation as causing blank and blank. Um, and so also the one thing is uh, what people often don't talk about. I'd love your thoughts on this is whenever people see gynecomastia in an athlete, they speculate, ah, they are, they're using testosterone. However, it could be because they came off. Their yeah. yeah. I think that's more, com- I think that's more common because it's like right. it, in sport, you you would be pretty even if you were in a very basic like a, a league with rudimentary basic testing you only have so much leeway with a bioidentical like testosterone whereby you're not exceeding threshold ratios for you know testosterone epi testosterone a variety of other biomarkers or urine markers that they'll be checking for like uh you know ratios and whatnot but in like as far as like the, the amount you can actually get away with is going to be like closer to, I don't know, like high normal borderline super physiological TRT levels. If you're not like highly have like a huge appetite for risk, I guess in general. So, um, yeah, like for me, like I would assume a lot of the case, the hormonal imbalance is going to be caused by a crash and, or, you know, a subsequent pulling out of those hormones and leaving you in that deprived environment where you have that imbalance or total deficiency of androgen offsetting estrogen induced RNA transcription at the receptor site to actually prevent that glandular development from occurring. So yeah, like in general, the the manifestation of gyno is like most often a case of like guys who are using excessive amounts of compounds that are substrates for aromatase or individuals who have like, like hypogonadal men, so much gyno in hypogonadal men, despite the fact that they have low T and like low amounts of estrogen, you know, on paper, perhaps they still have manifestations of gynecomastia and you would think, oh, why is their estrogen in range, but they still have, you know, a, a tit developing? Like, that's why. Yeah. yeah. And well, and um, there's a very interesting interaction between prolactin and estrogen, uh, at least in the brain. And I, I think it was, uh, you know, I, I probably in the past, I've, I've tried to emphasize the, the importance of prolactin, probably to the detriment of, of the, uh, the, the... I think that might have been like our one, like, uh, big, like... <laughs> point that I touched on the Joe Rogan thing, but anyway, it's oh, totally cool. Yeah, no, no, you know, and, and I think that, um, totally valid, um, to, to, uh, assess what other information that's out there. Um, and you know, the, the point that I, the, here's how I would say, um, I view it, which is that prolactin and estrogen, uh, operate on a parallel pathway. You know, there are a lot of systems in the brain, as you know, in body that are push pull, right. Mm-hmm. Dopamine and prolactin are very push pull. Uh, surprisingly, testosterone and estrogen are not as much push pull as they tend to kind of float up and down together in parallel. But, you know, in most individuals, testosterone is just higher. So the ratios yeah. tend to follow in general, right? And, but prolactin and, and testosterone 
because of the relationship between dopamine and testosterone being very much in parallel, then when testosterone, you know, anytime you adjust down dopamine and prolactin goes up, there tends to be both a, a slight blunting of testosterone levels, as well as an amplification of estrogen. And that's when I think this ratio of estrogen and testosterone starts to get a little wonky to the point where what the way I view it is that um, prolactin is either directly or indirectly making the tissue uh, of the body more sensitive to, to low amounts of estrogen that are there. And this is exactly mm -hmm. the way you describe these um, hypogonadal men who have low levels of testosterone because they're hypogonadal. They have low levels of estrogen, but those low levels of estrogen are able to, to have an amplified or exacerbated effect on the tissue because the levels of prolactin are, are, are sort of synergizing that. And yeah. um, obviously this is happening on different time scales. It's very hard to parse. I mean, when you start to realize, I mean, the hormone systems are so incredible because they work on fast time scales, medium time scales and short time scales, and they're even controlling gene expression. So yeah. it's like, um, it's really, uh, it's hard to tease apart, but I, I think that, um, well, isn't there a, a practice in the bodybuilding community of people taking anti pro either pro dopamine or anti pro Yeah. Yeah. Dopamine? So like, uh, people oftentimes when they use progestogenic compounds that they think are going to raise their prolactin. And in general, what we see is like the prolactin increase is usually coming as a consequence of high estrogen. Like, I think that's sort of like you meant the parallel of estrogen going up sort of like encourages the prolactin to rise in unison. Is that accurate? Yeah. yeah. So basically you see these individuals using um, cabergoline or pramipexil to try and attenuate the prolactin side of the equation whilst concurrently using aromatase inhibitors to attenuate the estrogen side of the equation, they end up on like a clusterfuck of like cardiotoxic and neurotoxic drugs in order to just like run their too high of a dose of like exotic compound to grow muscle. And it's just like, you know, obviously there's a smarter way to design like a, you know, performance enhancing drug regimen where you're not on a cocktail of things to counteract the bad part of the drug that you probably shouldn't be using or the dosage that you're using is just exceedingly high for what you're trying to get out of it. But yeah, like I think that's also what causes the gyno development in puberty. So significantly is the giant spike in GH and IGF one as a consequence of like trying to like, obviously grow a goddamn like skeleton to, you know, significantly bigger proportions. You have the estrogen, you know, actual stimulation of breast tissue development, but also the GH and downstream IGF one seems to be proliferative as well. And then the prolactin on the, prolactin agonism of the receptor as well as progestogenic activity potentially from progesterone appears to be stimulatory as well and the only like antagonist you really have from all of that occurring is androgen so if you're hypogonadal and you have like this layering of like i don't know igf1 estrogen even if it's deprived but you still have some and then you have the prolactin thing that you said would otherwise exacerbate it too i don't know progestogenic activity it seems to all be cumulatively just like problematic in that, you know, development. I think that's probably what leads to a lot of, I think the GH IGF one thing is huge in the pubertal gyno manifestation, but in the hypogonadal man, I think it's like the lack of androgen relative to all these like stimulatory inputs that people are not considering for sure. But yeah, in the bodybuilding community, I tend to go on tangents, my bad, but yeah, they use cambergoline no, no, and, I, I and Pravi well, you know, Yeah. I asked because it, you know, they, they're doing all this experimentation and it's, uh, it's sort of an interesting, uh, uh, data set, uh, so to speak. What, what's, um, I think your comment about puberty is a really important one. Uh, I've told David Sinclair this and I, and I, um, uh, and I'll say it here again, I mean, puberty is a very interesting stage of, of human development because first of all, it's the, it's the fastest rate of aging that anyone will undergo. I mean, if you look at just as a plot of, of body transformation, as you mentioned, it's a tremendous overhaul of all the systems and tissues of the body. If I think that if people want to learn a lot about how hormones impact the brain and body studying the biology of, of puberty is fascinating. Yeah. Um, and obviously you, you know, this literature, um, right down to the guts, but the, um, you know, the, the interactions between the hypothalamus and the pituitary and the body at this time, and is dramatic. And you're talking about IGF one, um, and growth hormone. Um, I think it, it, I'm curious to your thoughts on, you know, I, uh, on peptides, you know, that, so right now there's a huge surge in the number of people that are interested in peptides.